So welcome back to the show. I'm very honored today to have uh, Dr. Stuart McGill as a guest today. Uh, we'll be talking about kind of lower back pathologies and what to do after you've experienced a uh, low back injury. Uh, so before we begin, can you kind of introduce yourself to the audience uh, really quick, Dr. Miguel? Okay, well, good day, uh, Eugene. Uh, I was, I'm a retired professor. I was a professor for 30 years at the University of Waterloo, where I started out asking a very simple question, how does the back work? And uh, we developed two different laboratories. One was the laboratory equipped to take real spines and load them and create the injuries to try and understand what mechanical uh, scenarios uh, caused very specific types of back injuries. And the other uh, laboratory was set up to measure real people. And we would measure the stress distribution in their various body parts based on posture and load and movement and activity and that kind of thing to learn uh, what strategies uh, migrate stress from one tissue to another to enhance performance and help people uh, rehabilitate. Uh, obviously, you had to deload certain parts and how might you do that. And then the third piece of the puzzle was we opened up a, uh, a back injury clinic and uh, I started out um, setting aside two hours for each person or their consult and my colleague said are you crazy no one does two-hour consults and uh, i found well i i need to interview them quite extensively and do some pattern recognition of of their pain in their life and what are the impediments why didn't they get better before why did they fail why are they coming to us and uh, then we would uh, do provocative testing and try and create their pain uh, at least from a discomfort level, and then we tried to take their pain away. And we found that uh, it was so empowering to show the person uh, and discover for the first time, this is quite precisely what is causing your pain. Uh, stop doing X, whatever X pain trigger is, and do Y, and we would guide them as to what Y was, and we wound down their pain and followed the success or unsuccess of, of every single patient. So that's how it all started. But the final piece of the story was after the first year, we moved the appointment to three hours. And that's unheard of, but it was required in our view to be the first group in that person's life who worked to understand why they had pain. Man, that's like a big upgrade from the usual three to five minute assessment that you get in most offices. So <laughs> it's like a couple thousand thousand times longer. <laughs> it yeah, is. I mean, for the audience, um, uh, I basically ran into Dr. Stuart McGill's work on total, uh, totally by accident. I had a uh, pretty bad lower back injury doing squats like back in 2000, 2015. Luckily, it wasn't like super devastating and the pain was very like centralized in my L5 S1 disc. And I went to, um, obviously I went to like a medical doctor first, you know, and they're like, oh, just take these painkillers and you'll be okay. And then I was looking for something more kind of like elaborate and extensive, kind of like a deeper program. So the next person I went to was like a chiropractor. They kind of like you mentioned did like a quick assessment it lasted maybe like 10 minutes max they didn't ask too many questions and they quickly showed me like one or two stretches to do they might have done like some very very basic art and then maybe like a quick adjustment here and there but didn't give me once again like a comprehensive plan of you know how i should be moving throughout the day what i should be doing what i shouldn't be doing what are my pain triggers and then I went to a physical therapist all these phd guys is kind of the same exact thing it was like a little bit wishy-washy and um, uh, finally, actually, coincidentally, it just kind of got a lot better, maybe like six or seven weeks down the line. I was about like 90 percent recovered at that point because I just took a complete rest uh, rest time. I wasn't doing anything anyways. And um, but I did have these minor uh, episodes from there, you know, like it was fine for a month, but then like something would happen and it kind of like tweak again and hurt quite a bit. And eventually, like I wanted to climb Mount Fury. And I hired uh, former Army Rangers to help me train for the program. And unknowingly, he was actually using a lot of your material in the program, which I didn't know until about like a year or two years later until I ran into your books. 
And in retrospect, I was like, man, this like $30 book, which I have right here, uh, your back mechanic book. And I also like I used the uh, ultimate back and fitness and performance book, two great books, in my opinion. Um, kind of in total, they cost, I don't know, like 60 bucks, both of them together. I forgot the exact price, but it was able to be like a lot more effective than all of these like MDs and PhDs. And I guess my question for you is, I mean, is the whole entire low back rehabilitation industry still in like the infancy dark ages? Because from my understanding, the material in the book is pretty straightforward. I was easily able to apply it and easily able to uh, relieve my pain and not have any pain for, for quite a while already. Uh, that's uh, quite a political uh, question with a little bit of uh, science and social force <laughs> impacting it. But maybe I'll start like this. Um, I, I, I think one of the reasons is uh, clinicians now don't get training on how to do an assessment. Um, the uh, monetary forces in medicine uh, forces clinicians to do things that are billable procedures. So if you go to a, a surgeon, their billable procedure is a surgery. Or if you go to a, a, you know, a certain kind of therapist, they have a billing code. But no one has a billing code for an extensive assessment. So they've lost their skill. Had you gone to a clinician 20 or 30 years ago, you probably would have got a, a much more comprehensive uh, exam that would show you don't have nonspecific pain. You have very specific pain, and here's what the specifics are. So they've almost de-evolved, I think, because of economic and, and the social forces in the, in the modern uh, medical system. So uh, having said all of that, I had to write back mechanic. And I'd written books for clinicians explaining competent assessment procedures and that kind of thing. But they're unreadable for the average person with back pain. So I wrote back mechanic in lay language and I take the person through a quite rudimentary assessment. But it's better than the assessment that they're going to get from their clinician. And they yeah, reveal to themselves, they reveal to themselves what motions, what postures, what activities cause their pain, but it also reveals what doesn't cause pain. And then the rest of the book guides them on what not to do and what to do. Uh, and then finally build that foundation as you had to do to gain your robustness back to climb the mountains and, and travel the way you do. So uh, I'm glad it helped you, but that was uh, that. That's my view on the nature of of medicine and why it is right now. I know, like I get a lot of people that um, aren't that health conscious when they do have like a low back injury. Their first question is like, "Oh, I need to get surgery." before they even contemplate like doing anything else whatsoever. I know that's kind of a loaded question, but can you kind of go into, you know, if surgery is really necessary or what percentage like actually really need surgery, even in kind of very severe cases or they can kind of recover naturally through the proper steps and processes. So, yeah, no, it, it's an eloquent question and it's a very important question. Uh, there's a whole chapter in back mechanic addressing, do you need surgery? Well, I find uh, usually the person is in that position having to make that decision by default. Someone will say to them, oh, we tried physical therapy, it failed. We tried chiropractic, it failed. We tried a, a cognitive behavioral approach, it failed. Therefore, by default, the last thing left for you is surgery. But what was the physio that they got? Were they assessed? Was the physio matched to their particular pain mechanism? Chances are if they failed, it wasn't. So the problem with surgery as the final option is it involves a risk and a point of no return. Someone is going to take a knife and alter the anatomy of your back. Um, that involves risk. You have to prove to yourself and the surgeon must prove it to you that their knife is going to cut the pain out. Now, if they can't prove it, it's, it's a high-risk surgery. If they can prove it, it's a low-risk. So the uh, surgeon should go through 
uh, a comprehensive exam to prove that the thing they're going to cut out or the thing that they're going to alter is in fact the singular pain mechanism. If it happens that the person has two or three sources of pain operating on one, will not have a, a chance to, uh, to get rid of the pain. Um, I, I see patients who, I, I, obviously I don't see the surgical successes. Well, if they're an elite athlete, I, I, I might. But for the average person, I only see the surgical failures. And it's heartbreaking. They were rushed into surgery way too soon and, and they end up with a, a botched outcome. Interestingly enough, what is the mechanism that surgery works by when it does? I am absolutely convinced in some people it's nothing more than forced rest. So you told me you rested. Uh, let's take uh, a example of a person who says, I have to go to the gym every day and ride the elliptical trainee, trainer for 40 minutes. Because if I don't, it's the way I manage mental stress. And if I don't, I'll come home and I'll murder my husband and kids or whatever <laughs> that rationale is. Um, and then they'll say, well, okay, you can have surgery and we'll see if it works. But I'll tell you what, let's mitigate the risk. Let's perform virtual surgery. And that is pretending you had the surgery and you recover the following day as if you really did. So you're not going to the gym and riding the elliptical for 40 minutes. You are going to rest, get up, walk a short distance, have another rest, etc., and then slowly reintegrate your activities of daily living in a mindful, spine-sparing, spine hygiene, skilled sort of way, and then slowly build your life uh, up, just like you were recovering from surgery. Eugene, we followed up with every patient we ever saw at the university. Of the people who were told their last resort was surgery, we followed every single one of them. Following the approach in back mechanic got 95% of them to avoid surgery. So that was following the virtual surgery approach. I can stand by that. We measured it. So uh, there you go. Um, having said that, the rest of that book chapter um, adds a few more uh, checklists to follow to decrease the risk of surgery. Say you are convinced now that you need it. Uh, the surgeon must prove to you that they're going to cut the pain out. They must uh, be able to describe to you what their success rate is in that particular procedure and find out what success means to them. Some surgeons, it means you didn't die, and others means you can go back and deadlift uh, 200 kilo. You know, those are two very different uh, definitions of uh, success. If there's more than one level or one anatomical target as the surgical target, the risk goes way up. It's so much cleaner just to have, oh, they've proven you've got a dynamic disc bulge that's fissured. There's uh, some nucleus material pressing on this particular nerve root. They know exactly what to do, exactly how to teach the person in rehab to not replicate the mechanics that caused it in the first place so it doesn't re-herniate. Um, what is the rehab, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if the surgeon avoids answering some of those questions, run the other way. But a good well, surgeon... Gonna, sorry will, to interrupt, but I presume that's going to be like 99% of surgeons then, in most but, cases. Am I wrong? I don't know what the percentage is. And in my clinical experience, it's very regional. Uh, there are some many cultures within surgery, within certain states, if you're in the U.S., where that, uh, if we called it medical arrogance, uh, exists, that's certainly a lot stronger than in uh, some, some other parts. And, and certainly even within some hospital systems, uh, you'll find uh, that culture of openness is, is quite different. So I, I, I don't know if that's a sufficient answer or not. I, gotcha. I don't know the numbers, but uh, gotcha. I know exactly what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, one thing I did notice, uh, at least from the few people that I know get cortisone shots for their low back pain, is oftentimes they just kind of rely just on that to reduce their low back pain. I rarely see them take kind of like the lifestyle variables into consideration or uh, kind of like if they're like extremely overweight, lose weight to help reduce the, the pressure on those discs or kind of learn to move better or just at least have like a basic understanding of like biomechanics or the human body in any way. 
I don't know if you've experienced that kind of mentality that typically relies on cortisone shots as well. Oh, absolutely. The cortisone uh, may have, uh, I mean, <laughs> you, you've hit the nail on the head. Why not choose the intervention that will have the highest chance of uh, changing the situation and it's removing the physical cause of the pain you said an interesting thing in your introduction when you were talking about uh, chronic pain i don't believe that chronic pain exists in the back quite as much as other people uh, i think when you assess the person you will find it's actually many acute episodes that compile up all day long, giving the impression they've got chronic pain. But if you take away those small little uh, picking of the scab mm -hmm. kind of insults, the chronicity winds down. So what's the key? The key is to manage the many insults and uh, watch, uh, understand the movements and the postures and the loads, etc., that are picking away, tenderizing that, that sensitive spot and uh, allow it to settle. I mean, the analogy is imagine stubbing your toe. Uh, okay, you do it the first time, your toe's a bit sore. You do it again, it hurts like mad. You do it again, it's highly, all you do is lightly touch your toe and uh, you'll scream. I think people do this with their backs. Stop stubbing your toe and stop offending your back with a continual uh, whatever the 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 moisture mo mo moisture motion posture load turns out to be, and that's where you people come in. Um, I'll, I'll, maybe this is the right time to say this, but when you look across the broad rubric or spectrum of healthcare, and then you look at the things that influence a person's lifetime health. Every health system depends on good movement. Too much movement, you break them down. They get sick and injured. Not enough movement, they're a sloth. Their tissues are in a state of atrophy. But to build the body requires optimal movement for, for everything. Even, even your teeth <laughs> require a training and a workout. Otherwise, the ligaments holding them in will atrophy. So now let me ask the question, who is the movement expert among the full spectrum of healthcare? Is it the surgeon? No. Is it the family doc who will prescribe a drug or a medication for diabetes and, uh, you know, atherosclerosis of the heart and all of these other things? No. The person who owns movement is the trainer. The responsibility for the trainer to become as educated as they possibly can is paramount. And uh, I'll stop, I'll get off my little soapbox now, but things like what you're doing with these podcasts and, and, and trying to assist in this always uh, continuing process of becoming a master of the craft, becoming a master of the craft of movement is probably the largest thing a person can do for the lifelong health status. Yeah, I would totally agree. Well, what, what's your take on, I know there's also, especially with low back pain, like a very popular field that presumes that low back pain is the result of basically emotional trauma over the years that manifests themselves like physically in the body. And basically that pain is the result of this kind of like emotional trauma or some kind of uh, like blockage emotionally and that results in the, in the pain of the back and that it could kind of be cured at that level. Right. Well, uh, one very popular uh, person in that area was Dr. John Sarno, and he wrote his his book that uh, a lot of people say it's helped them. And I should say right at the outset that that I'm a very strong believer in the power of positive thinking. I, I, I've read The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale two or three times, and there's been certain times in my life where that has helped me get through uh, a challenge I was dealing with at the time. Having said that, if that approach helps the person and gets rid of their back pain and they're robust for life again, fabulous. Good news. Uh, I'm sure they exist, but I would never see them. I only see the failures. And here's what happens. The person will take this very mindful approach, neglect the physical aspect of their pain, and it doesn't work. 
now they get more mentally distraught. What's wrong with me? I, I, I don't have the mental power to, to think my way and emotionally strengthen myself to get rid of this pain. No, they've got real tissue damage because of the things that they've, they've done, either the way they train or the way that they conduct their life. So uh, if, if the cause is mechanical, you, you can't avoid this. You have to have some element of mechanics in your intervention. Uh, so that, that's really all I can uh, say about that. What I can say is the mental uh, drivers and influencers of pain are not separate from the physical. Uh, my good colleague, Bill Maris, a professor at Ohio State University, did wonderful experiments where he would show that after he personality profiled groups of workers and then put them into stress, the ones with a timid personality, when they were stressed, it manifested by uh, co-contracting and holding tension in their body, physically loading themselves, where people with more overt, confident kind of uh, personalities, it was water off a duck's back, and, and that mental stress didn't transfer into physical stress uh, the same way. So we know these things are related, but then the final piece is, if you did some sort of cognitive behavioral approach only to address the mental components, uh, and they had physical pain, uh, it will probably re re result in more mental dissonance. However, if you address the cause, being the way that they're lifting, the way that they're sitting, the way that they're training in the gym, address that. Now, all of a sudden, they're getting to sleep a little bit better. Uh, their mental toughness uh, grows. Um, in other words, the mental elements disappear on their own. So our approach is to treat the mechanical and uh, allow the mental to most of the time take care of itself. We would never start the opposite way with here is a cognitive behavioral approach. And by the way, we may or may not adjust your posture and your training and training progressions and that kind of thing. Usually, um, I, I, I did give great credit to the responsibility of the trainers to get it right. I see patients, I would say more than half of them because their trainers got it wrong. Yeah. Yeah. That happens a lot as well. So, well, regarding the importance of, you know, having a competent trainer or having a competent training system, uh, what would you say? Like if a person did have kind of a, a low back injury and they wanted to get into squatting and dead squatting and deadlifting again, um, what are some steps you would recommend to a person that to make it a safe transition or should they kind of stay away from squatting? I heard some chiropractors uh, when I first had my injury just say like, oh, you, you shouldn't squat or deadlift anymore. You're not like a professional athlete anyways. You just do like other exercises and it's not going to change things overall in the grand scheme of things. Like what's your take on that? Well, it's a fabulous question and uh, it's the right question because we follow eras in medicine and training and right now i would say it's quite popular to include deadlifts and squats into the average person's uh programming probably more so than say 10 years ago um so is it is it <laughs> there's no question i see patients who were re were created by trainers who got far too rammy and rambunctious with deadlifts. Uh, a deadlift is a highly technical exercise. Now, we had a little bit of a conversation offline uh, before we started, and I asked you about the origin of your name, and, and you said it was Ukrainian, and that's what I suspected, because uh, you'll notice that a lot of the science that we've conducted over the years has been extensions of the Russian, Ukrainian, Polish, Bulgarian, wealthy sports science. What they did in the 60s, 70s, and 80s was fabulous uh, science and, and formed the foundation for a lot of what we do. Uh, those are strength nations. They know squats. They know deadlifts. They know how to coach them. Unfortunately, too many trainers in the U.S. don't realize the technicalities of 
a deadlift. It is enormous. Uh, so that that's the, the 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 first foundational part. The second part is is the deadlift even the right tool to achieve the goal? So now I'm going to go back to training 101. Let's take a client. And how does the average trainer go about uh, training their client? The average trainer, I suspect, has a pet program. They're following a certain guru or philosophy, and everybody gets the same push, pull, lift, lower, squat, deads, uh, et cetera, kind of a program. But the elite trainer doesn't do it that way. The elite trainer says, what are the demands of your life? And then what are the demands going to be with the goals that you have of your training? So that's quite a conversation that, that a great trainer starts with. What are the goals and what are the demands? And then the great trainer will test their client for their ability to meet those demands. That's called building capacity. Then the trainer says, what tools can I use to take you to meet those demands from the capacity you already have. Now, if you already have the capacity to meet those demands, we're there. We don't train it. We train the difference. And this is how I deal with elite athletes who have ungodly demands on their body. So we've got to train those that un ungodly uh, capacity. Or with a back pain person, they're in the same category. The margin for error isn't uh, much uh, less there. So the question is, is a deadlift the best tool to take their capacity and uh, allow them to, to meet that demand? It may or may not be. Um, when I look at someone like Brian Carroll, who I, I wrote a book with called Gift of Injury, Brian Carroll, um, if you look at the powerlifting scoreboard through the 2000s, um, and they would take every uh, powerlifting meet and they would look at who scored and ranked in different weight divisions and whatnot. If you go through that, and then I think it was someone from Westside who put all this together, Brian Carroll was number two <laughs> throughout the 2000s. I mean, this guy was a, was a superstar in, in lifting. But um, he came to me as a patient terribly injured and, and uh, disabled. Now, uh, he had, his business was deadlifting. He was a power lifter, as you know, dead squats and, and bench press. And uh, when we started the rehabilitation process with him, it was number one, get moving well and take the stress off the injuries. And uh, he had some very substantial uh, end plate fractures and vertebral fractures and disc herniations. I mean, he, he was pretty banged up. Um, anyway, knowing what the precise nature of the injuries were, we, we had a, a, a pretty good idea of what the programming should be. So could we integrate a deadlift back into him? No, we couldn't. He didn't have any capacity to bear weight. He had end plate fractures. So we slowly built that over time by avoiding deadlifts. And for a year, he did bone callusing and how he integrated and reintroduced his weight bearing capacity once again was through carries, things like unilateral suitcase carries. So we completely avoided deadlifts in order to build the base foundation to eventually mm -hmm. get to deadlifts, if you, if you see the logic. So uh, my, my answer is really it depends and it has to go on a case-by-case -case basis, but that will at least describe the process that, that a great trainer will go through to organize the uh, first of all, a matched rehabilitation to give a, a base capacity uh, and then uh, really build it. But, you know, having said that, that's Brian Carroll's story. But take maybe your client who, let's take the example, she's uh, a 34-year-old stay-at-home mom with two young kids. Now, you, you, you find it, well, what, what hurts your back? Okay, sitting in the rocking chair hurts my back. I have to do it for 40 minutes. Picking my child out of the crib at 2, 2 a.m. in the morning for feeding, that hurts my back too. And you'll say, wait a second, isn't that a deadlift? And it isn't really. It is a hip hinge 
where you stiffen the upper body and pull the hips through as you're you're as a jib crane uh, lifting that child. So again, would a deadlift be the best for that stay-at-home mom, even of a very modest weight of a barbell off the floor with two, you know, a, a cookie, a 45-pound plate either side? Who said that had to be the starting level? The size, the diameter of the Olympic uh, weight it was an arbitrarily chosen size. Wouldn't that trainer be far better to teach just a hip hinge starting at a very modest level, maybe a goblet squat or something like that would be so much more transferable from the gym getting to the thing that affected that woman's capacity and uh, athleticism to be resilient for life and then move to a sandbag. So there's just two different examples and maybe two different uh, uh, takes on it all. Well, are there certain, let's say it is uh, like determined for one reason or another that the deadlift should be done. Are there certain deadlifts that typically put more strain on the lower back? Kind of like, for instance, just doing a normal deadlift versus like a trap bar or uh, doing a deadlift off the ground. Is that puts more? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah a absolutely. Everything that you just listed influences the, the distribution of stress through a body. So the height of the bar starting, that's a decision that a trainer has to make. Are you going to pull a bar from the floor or are you going to pull a bar off blocks? That might be one uh, for a pull. Um, let's move to a squat now. You mentioned, well, where do we place the bar? Should it be a high bar placement across the traps? If they've got messed up rotator cuffs, that's all you have. You can't place the bar any lower. Um, but if you want to win at powerlifting, uh, you, uh, if you have a, uh, a certain body type, for example, you, and, and the weakest part of your lift is your back. If you can get the bar lower down your back and make it more hip centric, you'll lift more load. So it's a matter of bar placement and migrating the load away from the weak area to the strong area or away from the pain triggered area to the pain robust area. So trap bar, uh, the, the thrust line from a trap bar is much closer going down through the low back. A person with a high bar has to be pitched more forward. So that moves the thrust line forward and makes it more hip centric, uh, for example, versus uh, sending the load uh, to the knees. So it's a great question. All of these things are important. But, uh, you know, if you have an NHL hockey player and uh, you're, you're trying to program them, what's the transference of a deep squat to the ice in the NHL? And I would submit it's zero. Uh, I've had to deal with, I can think of about three different NHL players who their careers were shortened by trainers insisting they squat deep and blew up their... Their, their backs because hockey players quite typically don't have a lot of hip mobility. And if you're going to squat deep, if you don't have hip mobility, where does the mobility go? The stress goes to the spine. So the requirement for squatting deep is to have A, anatomically shallow hip sockets, and B, not ones that are blocked up through uh, chronic activity, like playing hockey or sitting all day in the office or whatever it happens to be. So, you know, it's a great question. None of us will know the answer, though, until we get um, that individual in front of us. Hey, everyone. Thanks for checking out this podcast. If sourcing high quality food is something you're interested in, but definitely find the subject matter confusing, check out my book on Amazon titled Anti-Factory Farm Shopping Guide. It's a very easy and non-technical read that's beautifully illustrated and comes with a comprehensive video series and other extended learning material. The book, in a very simplified way, breaks down the difference between caged, cage-free, free-range, and pasture-raised meats. It'll cover how to avoid GMOs, source high-quality water, fish, supplements, and many other related topics. Thanks again for checking out the podcast, and when you have a second, please check out Anti-Factory Farm Shopping Guide by Evgeny Trufkin on Amazon. 
Well, what are some other kind of like lifestyle uh, and other kind of like tips you would recommend a person implement in their overall uh, life when they are, obviously they had an uh, injury in the past and they're really trying to improve their, say like squats and deadlifts. What are some things they can do outside of the gym? And you already hinted at it kind of in the beginning of the podcast to really kind of make sure that injury doesn't reoccur. Right. Well, the foundational science to answer that gets right back to that question of capacity and uh, demand. Um, so know the demand that you're training for and then measure and know the capacity that they have. Now, let's say the person's already at full capacity. The demands of their life are using up all, all the capacity they have. Can you increase your training volume? The answer yeah, is no. probably best. No, yeah. no you, you can't. You're going to hurt them. So every trainer has to know that relationship. Otherwise, they're going to hurt their clients. So if they're already used up all their capacity, can you get it from somewhere else? The answer is yes. And that's where the art and science of it all comes from. So if they see their uh, client moving poorly, uh, using up some capacity just by sloppy posture, sitting poorly, walking poorly, training in the weight room, making movement flaws, they're using up more capacity than they need to. If the trainer can clean that up and not chew up so much capacity, guess what? You just created some free capacity by moving better. So you've just taken us into the world of spine hygiene and movement efficiency. And if you can do that, that's what the great trainers do. Now you can overdrive that training capacity and enhance volume. But the, the patient had to earn it by taking care 24 seven. In other words, their athletic training was all day long, but that's how you build champions. Well, is it, is it possible to have a healthy lower back if you're sitting for like eight to 10 hours a day? I don't know how to quite interpret the word healthy. If, if you can live with being a low capacity person leading a very boring passive life and you sit all day at the computer, you watch TV at night, if that's the way the person wants to live, so be it. I would say yes. They, they, many of them will have the capacity in their back. They don't stress their back. They don't have any back pain. But here's where the, the issue comes. The next person is interested in their health. And they want to rock and roll on the weekends and have a little bit of fun. What do they do? They go to the gym and they train with a trainer during the week. But they're a slave to the computer 10 hours a day. That's the reality of their life. And now it's so unfair. They've got back pain when they sit. Why? The training that they're doing for the hour at night is intense. Mm -hmm. But it might be inappropriate with move flaws and that kind of thing. So that sitting, if they never did the training, wouldn't hurt. But now it's adding to that total uh, demand and uh, they don't have the capacity for it. So uh, it's so important for that person who sits all day but really wants to have a life outside of that with some excitement to uh, train well, be with a competent trainer and uh, mitigate that, uh, that the, the pain and, uh, you know, understand the adaptation schedules of their discs and ligaments and muscle and everything else. Muscle adapts very quickly, like bodybuilding. It's, I'm not trying to offend anyone here, but bodybuilding and muscle hypertrophy is pretty basic stuff. But to hypertrophy and strength and bone and joints and the spine, that's a different level of expertise. I, I, I will say it's not as common as people think. Gotcha. Well, what's your take on, would you recommend like a standing desk for a lot of people? If the person is triggered by bouts of sitting and they get relief by bouts of standing, I would say absolutely yes. And I try, I mean, look at me. I, I was a professor for 30 years. <laughs> when I first started out, computers weren't even invented yet. And, uh, you know, slowly my life changed and evolved to this computer-centric world where students didn't even want to come to office hours anymore. They wanted to email, which I thought was very gross, but nonetheless. Um, 
I thought you would have been like most professors. You're like, oh, thank God, I can do something else during the office hours now instead of interact with students. You know? Uh, <laughs> th th no, that that wasn't my world. If you came to my lectures, it was you were out of your seats doing demonstrations and uh, learning movement techniques and feeling it in your body and all that kind of thing. Um, yeah, it was a either loved the way I taught or you hated it. If you wanted to sit in your chair, you probably wouldn't enjoy my <laughs> classes very much. But uh, anyway, so getting back to things like sit stands, chairs, uh, frequent breaks, posture changes, all these kinds of things, it, it, it's all a way of mitigating the chronic uh, prolonged exposure kind of stress from uh, sitting. Is but if, you're, if you want to be a couch potato and do nothing and don't train and don't play sports and don't have any fun much in your life, then it probably won't make that much difference to you. Hmm. Okay. Is it safe to say that kind of for good spy, uh, spine hygiene, you should kind of like avoid excessive like flexion of the spine while you're moving and try to keep it as like neutral as possible throughout movements? Well, I get quite misinterpreted on that. Usually when people hear me talk about uh, uh, that issue, there's a context for it. And that discussion always need a con needs a context. So if we're talking training and rehab, which I usually am, yes, those kinds of things are important. But if, if, if we move slightly away from that and make it a broader kind of answer. Um, what matters is, is the load in the posture. For example, um, if there's no load on a person's spine, bend it around, enjoy it, do cat camels, uh, be a gymnast, handle your body weight. Uh, just keep the total demand underneath the biological tipping point and you'll be fine. Um, you know, I watch uh, a fabulous athlete like uh, Idu Portal. Do you know who that is? The, the fella who uses animal movements and goes through a force. It's the most lovely display of athleticism. Another one might be Conor McGregor. Uh, most people know who, who that athlete is. Wonderful movement patterns, tremendous mobility, um, etc. But then you take an athlete like Brian Carroll or a CrossFit athlete, or someone who has to handle a lot of load. Now the spine has somewhat of a limit of mobility that it can have. So you can't have a whole unlimitless mobility and then have unlimitless capacity for load. Life is a trade-off. Just like in physiology, when a person wants a high VO2 max. So they're a marathoner, they want a high VO2 max. What that means is you can't have a, an explosive metabolism. They can't run and cut on a football field with high explosive power because to train fast twitch metabolism is, is polar opposite of, of slow twitch. I mean, I, I remember going back to the Polish weightlifting team. They were tremendous explosive athletes. They didn't want to walk upstairs because it would compromise the fast twitch metabolism and give it some uh, aerobic exposure and possibly weaken. Do you see what I mean? Everything in fitness is a trade-off. So flexion, spine mobility, there's a trade-off with load-bearing capacity. We did a study on Middle Eastern belly dancers. Huge spine flexion. and But do you know not one of those women could do a sit-up? They didn't have the strength. So do you see there was again polar opposite. If you want to be a yoga master, a belly dancer, a back off on the strength. If you want to handle load and strength, you're going to have to limit the uh, extreme ranges of, of motion a little bit to keep the uh, total load on the back un underneath the tipping point. So do you see why I, I know I get Ms. Cotto McGill says don't move your back and whatnot, but I'm talking about people with triggered back pain with mm -hmm. load, trying to pick up their child and yeah, don't move your back and you'll be a lot better off and desensitize the pain faster. Yeah. But uh, if you want to, if, if you don't have that injury, the whole, it's a whole different question in context. Well, what's your take on... Did you know that, by the way? Or ha have you only heard that other sort of impression of... You mean the... I suspect you knew that. that, that you answer... mean the criticism of not uh, bending the back or keeping it straight at all times? or Right. Uh, I remember reading it on a few comments, like in the Amazon section of your book. Um, it's not... Um, 
I just asked. I just asked as a general question. Yeah, I don't remember. It's, it's I don't. It's funny. I don't, I don't there remember. are there are people who do podcasts and whatnot. And say, oh, McGill says never bend your back, and I, I'm not. It just shows me they don't have much of a, a deep understanding. Uh, you know, for certain times, I say, yeah, it would that 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 would be very unwise to 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 not lock your back, but. Obviously, if, if for other times, if it's not a pain mechanism and the load isn't excessive, then I have an entirely different opinion. Anyway, I was just yeah. interested as to. Well, I think it's I think it's tough for any kind of healthcare provider that provides information or information products online because at the end of the day, you don't know exactly like who's reading your book and their specific situation. So it's really tough to communicate like all your ideas into like one book or one podcast, for example, and encompass everything you want to say. So a lot of times people, I feel, would go like, oh, he just said, uh, don't bend your back. That means he meant it like for every single person on earth, period, you know? Right. So I feel it's kind of like, first of all, it's impossible to be, to put information products out there that relate to every single individual on the planet yeah, yeah and their specific circumstances. And, but I don't know. The one time I've heard uh, anything say was just on a small, I think like Amazon comment. Someone oh, I- mentioned that. And honestly, I didn't pay attention to it because a lot of times just you hear comments like that from people that don't understand like biomechanics or the variability from individual to individual anyways, like you mentioned. So it's just like I asked moreover just as a general question because I yeah. thought like a lot of people would wonder, wonder that as well. So, hmm. well, what's what's your what's your take on um heavily heavy reliance on machines for working out such as like the leg press and things of that that nature and not using or not not relying too much on free weights well it depends i mean if you come to backfit pro hq which uh since i retired has now been moved to my home here though so the whole basement of my house is uh backfit pro uh if you go down there you'll see some machines so there's a certainly a time and a place that must be like a really short drive to work for you then yes (laughs) you're like literally get up just walk downstairs i'm at work yeah Yeah, right (laughs) But, um, you know, let, let's take uh, several different types of athletes and you'll see how the answer changes. Let's take an athlete who has to flex the spine and go under heavy load. Uh, let's take uh, a cyclist, a sprint cyclist, or let's take a downhill skier at the Olympics, for example. They ski down a hill, they hit uh, 80 miles an hour, and they hit a mogul and they're in a crouched, fully flexed position because they have to reduce windage and air flowing Mm -hmm. by. Now, could I take that person and put them into a high bar squat, round their back over, get them into a deep squat, and simulate uh, repetitive squats in that position? No, they're going to, and they've already got a back injury, that's why they're coming to see me. So that's not possible. However, um, one of uh, the machine that we have downstairs is a belt squat machine. It happens to be the mm-hmm. uh, uh, squat max MD, which is a heavy belt that goes around the waist. And we will, uh, clip that to a stack of weights that goes up and down a pillar. And there's a, a floor that opens up with a guillotine and the weight drops down and the person squats that, but there's no load from the waist on up. So they can develop tremendous squat horsepower in the hips and legs, which is what a skier and the cyclist wants, but they, they, they don't have the spine capacity to do it. So there's an example of, yeah, I'm going to use that machine. That's in fact, uh, the best way I can create tremendous horsepower in the lower half of their body and and spare their backs and make it tolerable um but if you uh, i think you use the example of a leg press very very I, I i really can't justify a leg press um the reason i don't know if you can see it i'll just tilt this down but if i'm sitting in a leg press like that, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that um, if i lower the weight to about here my femur and acetabulum is already colliding at that point my spine is going to round it pulls my back away and pelvis away from the support so that thrust line of the load coming down the sled now is shearing my spine Mm -hmm. 
and that is not a good situation to be in. So a leg press, if the person is going to limit the uh, uh, travel of the sled coming down the ramp, uh, they may have a, a situation for it. But I've seen a few athletes who've been injured where they allow the knees to touch the chest, for example, and butt wink is not okay there because the pelvis comes right off the pad and now it just gets sheared back, usually through uh, L, uh, L5-S1, which is the bottom lumbar disc. And that, that can be a fairly potent uh, injury mechanism with repetition and uh, numbers of training sessions, insufficient rest and all that. All, all those modulators that we uh, talk about. So, you know, we, we can talk about any machine like that. Uh, there are some specific to specific sports. Uh, well, what's your take? You mentioned the butt wink. Is that kind of like for the bulk majority of people safe to say that they should stay away from having a butt wink, let's say like during a squat? Yeah, well, from a general point of view, it's better not to have one. You know, is, is it okay to do this and arm bar myself every day? I'd be better off with shoulder health if I didn't do that, wouldn't yeah, I? Yeah, probably. <laughs> like, you got to do a study on that. Run it. Let it run a three-month study on that. <laughs> yeah, that. That's right. Chances are uh, that, that that's not a good thing, you know. And and the, the, in any of those things, people are looking for proof. And it, it's like, you know, it took 40 years of science to convince some people that smoking caused cancer. And one of the issues with that is you can smoke a cigarette today and you might not get cancer for 40 years. So when you have such a delayed outcome to the uh, trigger, then it's very, very difficult to uh, track with all kinds of cofactors. But here's one suggestion for people who... Uh, are wondering whether butt wink is okay for them. Uh, put a bar on your back, high bar, and then stand and do a pelvic tilt back and forth. Fully flex and fully extend your, your spine. Put a 45 cookie on either end of the bar, so now they're at 135. They got an Olympic bar with two cookies. Do 10 repetitions and be truthful now. Assess how your low back feels. If it's feeling a bit queasy, I think you just answered the question, is butt wink okay for you? <laughs> yeah, I think one thing, especially in the Western world, I feel people have lost the conscious awareness to be able to communicate with their body. And a lot of times your body is telling you like when to stop doing something, you know what I mean? But a lot of people like just don't listen to it or they get stuck too much in like scientific dogma, like this sample pool did okay. That means I'll do it. I'm in pain, but that's okay. I don't know if you've experienced that a lot in your career as well. Of course I have. It's it's crazy when you see people on uh, the internet, social media saying, oh, on my day off, I just squeezed out 100 squats. That was my day off. And and I, I think, you know, it's a badge of honor to go around being sore. I'm in my middle 60s now. I have zero pain. I've been never been so healthy. I feel fabulous. I don't have to, I don't want to train to go to pain. Mm -hmm. I want I want to train to be viable and healthy and have zero pain and go do what the hell I want. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I I guess it 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 take. There's an old Mennonite uh, expression: "You get old too soon and smart too late." <laughs> well, I do have. It's kind of a little bit off topic, but I do have a question for you. I did I did have a, some experience with construction work and farming work as well, and I noticed it's kind of like. Nothing can simulate the dynamic nature of that environment, I feel like, in the gym. Uh, of course, like if you do construction work, you still need that education on spine sparing movements. You know how to move correctly. You probably need some exercises for sure in the gym to help balance out the fact that you're probably like rounding your shoulders a lot, doing a lot of carpentry work and stuff like that. But what do you feel about kind of the limits of achieving kind of like physical fitness on just relying in the uh, just relying on the gym to do so, which is basically what ninety nine percent of people do, because a lot of people, for example, aren't athletes. They just kind of go to the office and then go to the gym, and all the physical fitness they get is just like linear patterns that they typically do in the gym. What's your you take know, on that? I, I do a lot of podcasts, Eugene, and I haven't been asked that one for a long time, and it's such a fabulous question. I I'll admit I don't like gym work. I only do that 
on days where I haven't done physical labor. So out here, we split our own firewood, for example. I love splitting firewood. That's Farm Boy Work 101. Um, construction, we do a fair amount of that around here. That's, that's fabulous training. You know, when we get, uh, say we get some NHL hockey players and they're farm boys from Ontario or Saskatchewan or Alberta, uh, it's incredible the farm boy strength, we call it, that they have. They don't have weak links in their body. You take a, a, a gym-trained person, precisely because of the mechanism you described, the linear patterns, they don't have farm boy strength. Mm-hmm. But if, if, if you get a, you know, and, and, and it, it really comes home to roost, say, in uh, MMA, uh, because a lot of their training is to simulate farm boy strength, and uh, you get a good you you get a hold on on you by a by a good Greco Roman re- wrestler with farm boy strength, it's ungodly. <laughs> It'll it, it it sure shows a person's flaws or strengths uh, very quickly. So I'm I'm very sympathetic to uh, your view, and uh, the, anyone who trains in a gym. It's only a substitute because they can't get out and do physical labor because physical labor would be so much more balancing of the strength through their bodies and all the rest of it. Yeah. So okay. I'm, I'm, I'm a real fan of uh, that uh, for sure. Yeah, because I always kind of had a tough time transitioning with that. And I'm like, man, I would have to work out in this gym like all day to simulate the amount of dynamic movement I would get from just doing construction for like four hours, for example, or three Absolutely. hours. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. That's I good wish, to hear I that wish from you. you lived closer. I'm enjoying yeah. you. You need we, help. You need we, help with the house and work. <laughs> I think we would have some fun together. Yeah. Well, do you have any? Are, are you coming out with any new books, or do you have any closing statements before we call it quits? Um, I'm currently working on a book right now, and uh, I I don't know what the name of the book is going to be. Maybe it'll be It Depends or something like that. But what I do, because I do so many podcasts, sometimes I I get asked a really interesting question. And the book will simply be those interesting questions and some of the answers. And some of them are really offbeat, and, and some of them are some of the tough questions that people don't like to ask, but they ask them, and, and they're, they have to be answered. Mm-hmm. With uh, you know, without hiding or political correctness or anything else, so that's uh, a book I'm working on now. But uh, I'm getting slow. I'm having so much fun splitting firewood. <laughs> hey, maybe that's her calling. You know, maybe you got to get into farm work or construction or something. Well, I, I, I I've done it all <laughs> my life. Uh, I uh, you know I I, I live three hours north of the university now, and I'm just having a ball. I'm in such a sweet spot of my life. Cool. Well, that's good to hear. I mean, I want to thank you personally. You know, your information has helped me a tremendous amount because honestly, like a pinched nerve in the back doesn't sound too bad for someone that doesn't have it, but it's, it's, it's really debilitating to the overall quality of your life. And I feel like with your information, I don't have to deal with that problem anymore. I might have like another industry, uh, injury later in life, maybe my shoulder or something. I don't know. But at least like, I feel confident that with the information you provided in those books and kind of very thankful that you took time out of your day to have a meeting with me today, I feel like well, my well, back Eugene, is can, can I ask you a question? Yeah. What, what, how would you answer? So a colleague comes to you and they say, I've just been on Facebook or Twitter or something like that, and now I'm hearing that posture doesn't matter. So just flex your spine when you do deadlifts and you know, just, just, just train. What's, what's your response with your background when you hear that? I feel it, it really does matter from personal experience as well, especially having like a good understanding of like spine sparing movements. For example, in my case, I had a, uh, I forgot exactly what it was on the MRI, but like a seven or eight millimeter disc herniation, a posterior disc herniation. And I know for sure that, um, Especially a few months after I've had it, any time I flexed my back, I would, I would feel it aggravate. So in, in my case, in that point, it would be kind of silly not to pay attention to my posture. I think that's like very pivotal just to overall health to have conscious awareness of what good posture even is, and especially how to apply that good posture to the activities you're doing throughout the day. Did your injury make you 
a better athlete now, a more resilient person, and a better master of your craft? Oh, yeah, way better. Way better, and then also just just way better, I would say, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it helps to go through a bit of trauma yourself and uh, get firsthand understanding. Okay, yeah. that's, that's, that's thoughtful. Thank you. Do you have do you have anything else to add before we close it up? Not no, I, you know as you know I'm not a social media sort, but uh, if anyone is interested in these uh, books or things that we do, our website is backfitpro.com. So that's all I can really uh, conclude with, I think. Okay, cool. And then for the audience members, I will have a link to your website, and then any other information you want to give me as well. So people can just kind of click on that and they'll be able to get a hold of your material. Okay. And I'm just looking at your bulletin board behind you. I'm so glad you're seeing, uh, seeing the planet. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good for you. Cool. Thank you, Mr. Miguel. Or Dr. Okay. Miguel. Yeah. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks, Eugene. Okay. Thank you. Hey everyone. Thanks for checking out this podcast. If sourcing high-quality food is something you're interested in, but definitely find the subject matter confusing, check out my book on Amazon titled Anti-Factory Farm Shopping Guide. It's a very easy and non-technical read that's beautifully illustrated and comes with a comprehensive video series and other extended learning material. The book, in a very simplified way, breaks down the difference between caged, cage-free, free-range, and pasture-raised meats. It'll cover how to avoid GMOs, source high-quality water, fish, supplements, and many other related topics. Thanks again for checking out the podcast, and when you have a second, please check out Anti-Factory Farm Shopping Guide by Evgeny Trufkin on Amazon.